afterwards or get a card and ask me well afterwards. Uh, and if you're just going to complain that I'm glossing over a lot of linguistic detail, yeah, I am. Get over it. Sorry. Uh, I only have one hour. Um, ooh. Hello. Advance, please. Okay. Uh, Twitter. Use the hashtags. Thank you. Uh, I also wrote a full paper for 2063. Uh, you can download it. It's good. It also is in Monochrome's new book, um, which is also really cool. So you should go buy that. Um, that one is a little bit more theoretical. Um, and this one is a little bit more hands-on. Most of what I'm going to do today is actually playing with a very small conline. Um, but there is only so much that I can cover in an hour. Um, so if you've got more questions, let me know. What is a conlang? It's a language that people make up. It's to linguistics what hacking is to theoretical computer science. Instead of just talking about how people have done it before and theorizing, we actually make languages. Um, this is a language with its own grammar, its own vocabulary that humans can use to talk about more or less anything, just like any other natural language. Uh, this isn't like a computer language or pig Latin or anything like that. Uh, so there are a lot of kinds of conlangs because people do it for all sorts of different reasons. Um, this talk is participatory. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be getting a bit more creative. So I want to get everyone warmed up. If you think you know the answer, just shout it out. Uh, if you are right, come up afterwards. Get a sticker. Uh, get a postcard. They're pretty. Uh, yay, bribes. I, prizes. Um, the symbol on this is the Conlang flag. It represents, represents the Tower of Babel against the rising sun. Translating the Bible passage uh, about um, the Tower of Babel isn't a religious thing for us. Uh, it's just traditional because uh, that describes God creating languages uh, to begin with, and we sort of extend that by making even more languages, so it's kind of appropriate for us. Anyway. Is everyone ready? Who's here? Oh, come on. Say something. Yes. Good. That's a lot better. Thank you. OK. What language is this? El encila lumen Nope. 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 It's not a natural language. I'll give you that. Yes. Specifically, Quenya. Um, Tolkien's elvish language Quenya is, is probably the most prototypical uh, pretty art lang. But everybody has a different aesthetic, uh, sometimes very different. Uh, Klingon, for example, sounds very harsh and guttural. Uh, and it's linguistically fairly weird, although plausible. Uh, Dritok uh, is even more weird. It doesn't even have any voiced sounds. So that sounds like d and g and all vowels, no vowels. Um, try to imagine that. So all of these are still art langs because they're made for an aesthetic concept. Um, however, there are other languages that aren't made for that. Um, here's one. La abeloi havas on set ili netaugas porcaresi. Anyone? Yes. Who said that? Good boy. Um, that is Esperanto. It's not the oldest. Uh, language um, that's an auxiliary language. Uh, and it's definitely not the best design. Uh, but by far, far more popular. It's got native speakers now. It's got a huge literature. Uh, they've got annual conferences, etc. It's very, very active. Um, other auxlings have tried to do better technically by borrowing, for example, vocabulary from places other than Europe. Um, by simplifying the writing system. You'll notice this has little uh, accent marks that some people find a little odd, uh, and so forth. Uh, but Auslang has, uh, as an Auslang, Esperanto has done pretty well. Um, they're, in general, they're a language that people want to uh, teach because it's neutral and uh, it's not going to be as imperialist as just making everyone learn English. Um, they're also much more popular because Auslingers actually care if other people speak their language. 
whereas Artlingers not really, uh, Artlingers are mostly doing it for themselves. Um, so there is there is sort of this balance here. Shmalu yemel bikenichu shkule. Anyone other than Jeffrey on that one? Lojban, yes, who got that one? You again, good one. Um, Lojban is the logical language. Uh, so in English, a pretty little girl's school could mean about 10 different things. Uh, in Lojban, you can be really, really precise. So for example, this means a small and pretty school for girls, as opposed to a school belonging to a somewhat small girl, which is also a reading of a pretty little girl's school. Uh, there's a trade-off, though, which is Lojban is precise, but fairly complex. Um, in general, Angelangs are the hacker languages. Uh, they're kind of hard to generalize because they all do something different. They're doing some kind of hack, uh, and they all take a different approach. Uh, some of them are because the creator of the language wants to fix something in natural language. Some of them are just thought experiments. Uh, some are just for the hell of it, because it's a challenge. Um, here's another language. Gavatna dahoi rihoi. Anyone have any idea what this is? No? Uh, that's actually kind of cheating, because that's only the second time that phrase has been uttered publicly. The last time was yesterday. Um, this is from the Dothraki language that we made for HBO that was in the news recently. Um, so yeah, people do this professionally. Uh, at the end of this hour, you are not going to be at this level. Uh, but you'll be started, um, and hopefully you'll join us someday. Uh, what am I into? I'm a hacker, so I am definitely an engineer. Uh One of the things that I'm working on, together with my partner Alex Fink, is a language which is spoken by two people using uh, finger presses. So zoom in. Uh, if you look at my hands really close, uh, instead of communicating by speech, this is communicated like this. For example, uh, what I just said was, may your conlang break your mind. Uh, this is from a Christmas card that we sent out to other members of the community recently as part of a big uh, card exchange. We've got a nice community. Um, also, as I mentioned, um, there's a short film. I'll tell you more about that later. But if you come back in an hour, you'll see it. Uh, I, other have an, I have another main conlang in interest personally, which is nonlinear languages. So this is the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, if you think of a normal writing system as an array of arbitrary symbols, uh, you, you sort of realize that it doesn't use the fact that the medium is two-dimensional at all, really. It's just wrapped. That's trivial. Uh, a nonlinear writing system is more like a graph. It uses the surface in an inherent way to try to express a different kind of grammar. Uh, I'm more of a theoretician in this realm so far. Uh, Skylar Devine, however, has implemented one that I think is pretty cool. So if you go to oe.org, uh, you'll learn a lot more about that. So how would you start making a language? Usually you have a goal in mind already, uh, but it's useful to spend some time thinking it out a little bit more detail. Do you want to name your D&D &D character? Uh, do you want to translate Hamlet from the original Klingon? What? Um, what do you want it to sound like? What is the culture of the people who are going to be speaking it? Uh, will it be uh, affected by some unusual feature? Uh, it might not, it might, um, but it's something to decide. So here is where we get creative. Instead of just talking about how to make a language, we're actually going to make one right now. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, for the multiple choice ones, I'm just going to list the uh, options and then go over them again, and you're going to cheer for the one that you like more. Uh, for the open questions, uh, when I prompt you, just yell out your suggestion. So, First question, are you ready? Good. Yay, one. Uh, so we're going to make a fairly simple naturalistic art line. Uh, you definitely should be exploring other options on your own, uh, or ask me later. 
but there's just a limit to how much I can handle on the fly in an hour. So, first off, what aesthetic are we going to go for? Pretty or hard? So, cheers for pretty. Cheers for harsh. They were louder. Second, uh, do you want to put any twists on this? So, for example, things that have come up before, uh, maybe the, think, the speakers think that rhyming indicates that something is true or good. Uh, maybe it matters whether, like in Japanese, whether they're talking to someone of higher or lower social status. Anything? An idea? Got something? Twisted, meaning what? Okay, so you want uh, the language to indicate social class in some way? Okay, uh, we can do that for sure. So we have a basic aesthetic. Now we need to decide what sounds are going to be in the language. Uh, languages actually vary a lot in what sounds they have. Uh, some languages have sounds like and and uh, which you'd probably find unusual. And others don't have ones that you would find very normal, like sh, th, or g. Uh, I'm going to be writing all of these sounds down in IPA, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. I don't have the time to teach that, but uh, if you want to, you can look it up on Wikipedia later. Or ask me. Um, so, yes. Oops, where did my thing go? Ah, there we go. So, harsh, social class, what? Okay. So, all, almost all languages have the sounds p, t, k, a, and e. So, I'm just going to add those. Hey, stop correcting me. Um, so, what else should I use that's going to sound harsh? In the language. Just shout out any sound and I'm going to add it. Come on. Ooh, linguist in the audience. Um, okay, so only stops and no voiced. Okay. Um, so of the unvoiced stops, uh, we have, um, let's see, p, t, u, um, no, that wasn't a good one. Uh, k, o, o. Um, for example, which ones do you like? All of them? Okay, so let's take a reasonable subset. Uh, okay, any other sounds? Come on, shout out a sound. G. Come on. You, shout out a sound. Sound, one sound. B. Okay. How about R? A uh, trilled R. Uh, anything else? No? Okay. You guys are a lot quieter than 26C3. Uh, so I'm going to flush this out a little bit. Um, so other sounds that are going to make it a little more natural, uh, I'm going to add one nasal, uh, actually no, it's going to have to be two nasals because we've got put and b, so that means that there's mm, mm, uh, might as well add one more vowel, uh, we've got a uvular, uh, so that implies velars as well, which we have. We have both k and g, uh, so that implies having both k and g. Um, and, yeah, reasonable enough for now. We can add more later. Yeah. Ch. You want ch, ch, 
or h. Number two, h, just h. Okay. Uh, while we're at it, we'll add, also add h contrastively. Uh, this is a contrast that's made, for example, in most Semitic languages like Arabic and Hebrew and Klingon. Which is not a Semitic language, yes, I realize that. Uh, okay, so moving back. So now that we know what sounds that we have to work with, uh, we need to know how they can form a syllable. Uh, so here, C means a consonant, V is a vowel, and N is a nasal consonant like N and M. Uh, English is actually pretty extreme in what it allows, uh, like strengths. Uh, most languages are much simpler than that. So you're gonna have three choices. Uh, actually, only two, sorry. I, I caught one of them later. Um, one is consonant vowel nasal, so like tokipona where you have something like mi lon pi mea, waso ike li tawa sike yon lawa mi, pipiaki limuku lilia noka mi, mi wilia eti. So you can see that the, uh, the syllables are all very uh, discrete. This is also the case in Japanese. Japanese has CVM. Uh, and the second option is CCDC, where you can have a bunch of consonants at the beginning, you can have any consonant at the end, and if you put a couple syllables together, then you have a little cluster there. Uh, anyway, so which one do you want? CVN, cheers. Okay, CCVC, cheers. Yeah. Louder cheers, okay. CCVC, it does. Okay. So uh, the other question is, what sounds the same? So most thing that, one thing that most people don't realize is that there are variations in how you pronounce sounds. Um, for example, can you tell the difference between these two sounds? P and P. P, P. Any, anyone hear a difference? Yeah, uh, that's by accident. Again, P. No one? Aspiration. Ooh, linguist. Uh, no, it's aspiration. So aspiration is this little breath of air that you get accompanying a sound. So everybody, uh, follow with me. Take your hand, put it in front of your mouth. Come on, you can all do this. Okay, now say pit. Pit. Hear this, feel this strong puff of air against your hand? Pit at the beginning of the syllable. Now say spit. Spit. Feel how you have almost no puff against your hand? This varies on dialect, of course. Um, but the difference is pretty drastic for almost all English speakers, except foreigners. Uh, foreigners tend not to learn this very well because it's not explicitly taught. And uh, if they don't know how we use it, then it's hard to know which one to do. And even if I had asked you which one you did in which circumstance, you wouldn't have been able to tell me two minutes ago, except for that guy, because he already knows linguistics. So uh, making these rules is a little bit more comp complicated. So um, does anyone have a suggestion for a phonological rule, oh linguist man? Not, I've got ones. That's okay. Uh, so, uh, we have no fricatives. We do have p. So, for example, this is a pretty common uh, one, which is called linish. So, I'm going to say that p turns to an f, and b turns to a v uh, when it's between a vowel. So that means, for example, if you have uh, appa, which we can say, right? We've got a and p, appa. 
So instead of that, it's actually pronounced afa, afa. Um, this is actually a very common rule. Uh, Spanish has uh, a number of lenition rules, um, although uh, they, they do approximations. So for example, instead of saying valle uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a v, valle, they say it with an approximate valle, valle, for example. Um, another one, uh, vowel reduction is always fun. So let's t say that a vowel goes to a schwa. A schwa is the sound uh, the, the really, really generic vowel sound, uh, in a unstressed syllable, for example. That's enough for now. Um, if you're doing a professional language, or if you're, if you're really spending time and making something naturalistic, this list grows very quickly. Uh, it's just a little bit more advanced than I can cover right here. Uh, so for example, the, the second one, suppose we wanted to make an example. So suppose we had something whose hypothetical form was, uh, let's say, cup, uh, cup up, for example. So this is a perfectly legal form, right? We have all those things. It follows our phonotactic. However, uh, the P, because it's two, between two vowels, turns into an F. So that's kafak, right? Instead of kapak, it turns into kafak. And then, because this one is not the stress syllable, um, it's actually pronounced kafak instead of kafak. Know the difference? Kafak, kafak. Ka, a, a, a. Okay. So that's just an example of applying those. Now, of course, uh, no language actually uses the IPA to be written down. Everybody has their own writing system. Uh, a lot of languages use the Roman writing system, like English. Uh, a lot of languages don't. If you go visit Omniglot, you'll see that there's lots and lots of different languages out there with lots and lots of different writing systems. And there are a lot of really cool created languages uh, with their own writing systems, but that takes a lot of time to cover. So for now, we're going to do a very simple thing, which is called Romanization. Romanization is where you use the Roman alphabet to write these down. So. For each of these, we need a letter in the English alphabet. So the first ones, P, T, K, A, I, Q. What should we use for the sound? Uh, like in uh, O, oh. there's a sound between those two syllables. What should we write it down as? Apostrophe, sure. How about G, B, R, N, M, U? These are all easy. How about R, R, R? Sorry? Uh, I don't know what that is. Not on a Mac. Uh, what is it? Yen? Uh, uh, I don't want to bother. Anyway, that's, that's uh, a little more complex than I wanted. How about something from the basic English alphabet? Z? Sure. Uh, huh? I guess H. What about H? H. CH? Sure. So, of course, uh, one thing you notice that is in English uh, and in many other languages like ours, um, there isn't a one to one corresponding. For example, if you Google fish, which is how you pronounce that, uh, you'll notice that the G-H is F, like in laugh. Uh, o is I, like in, I, I forget what. And T-I is SH, like in definition, right? This is fish, clearly. Um, so orthography has its own rules. It's complicated. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence like a lot of people think. Before we can actually make words, we need one more step which is how do you put pieces together? There are a few ways that you can do this. Um, isolating languages like Tokipona have each piece be 
an independent little unit. Uh, they don't combine them at all. So this, for example, Oweka and Nimi Namako, each of those is an atomic unit. Namako can't be broken down into Nama and Ko. It's just Namako, uh, which means word. Um, on the other hand, synthetic languages, like German, can stack a lot of pieces together and form one word. For example, there's the Rimfleische Tekitierungsaufwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz, which is the beef labeling supervision duty assignment law. Yes, this is a real law. Look it up. It's on Wikipedia. It's got to be true. Uh, and according to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, the politician who introduced this uh, law apologized when he did so, with good reason. Nevertheless, this is a legal word in German. Um, you can almost get something as crazy in English, like uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It's pushing it. Um, so within synthetic, you have two ways. Do you want to put pieces together, but how? Um, on the one hand, like Turkish, you can have each piece do its own separate thing. Kirdlum, uh, for example, kir is the root break. The d, the yor, or the ajak, uh, is present, uh, pa uh, past, present, or future tense. And the m, m, or nothing at the end is first, second, or third person. Uh, you, do you all know what person is? So me, you, they, first, second, third. Um, in Spanish, by contrast, each piece handles more than one duty. So rompimos, for example, imos is not just present tense. It's present tense and plural first person. Uh, rompi is is likewise. It's, it's a combination of things. So uh, there's also one other one which is uh, a bit different, which is uh, what are called templating languages, which is sort of like a regex. Uh, you have a pattern, and you have sort of ways to fulfill this pattern. Um, they're not as easily described, though. They're a more advanced issue. Uh, they can be really fun to do, and I strongly advise taking a look at one of these. Uh, this, for example, if you, if you know, this is called a, a triconsonantal root system because k, t, b uh, is this pattern that occurs in a whole lot of words. It means something to do with writing. And uh, if you think, for example, ian, ian, for example, if you think of that and you apply it to some other root, you'll get something sort of similar. It's probably going to be a noun. It's probably going to be an obvious thing uh, rather than a more extended meaning, etc. Uh, we're not going to do that, though. So we're going to make a simple choice, again, two choices. You want an isolating language, like Tokipona or Chinese, where everyone is a single atomic piece, or do you want an agglutinative language, where you can add a whole bunch of modifiers onto a word and make this big, long word. So cheers for isolating. Cheers for agglutinating. Yeah. Everyone likes B for some reason. Okay. Uh, gluttony. Mmm. Fine, you're hacking my voting system. That's cool. Um, so we're going to actually make some words now. Um, here's where it gets a little fun. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So, does someone want to propose a sentence to translate? If not, I have. A simple sentence for us to translate into this new language. Whoa, whoa. We can do hello world. Okay, hello world. Fine. So, hello world. Okay, so what words are in hello world? There's hello, there's world. Right? So, uh, hello. Uh, there are some languages where hello is actually not expressible as a single word. Uh, it might be a combination, like good morning. Uh, it might be bound to something like that. It might be just a single word. Uh, what do you guys think? Should it be a single word, multiple words, what? Single word? Okay. What word? Make a word. You've got the consonants and the vowels. You know how to put them together. Slop them together in some way. 
and tell me what hello is. Again? Gabruch? Gabruch, actually? Yeah? Okay. Uh, world. What's world? Come on, it's like Tinker Toys, it's not that hard. Kibu. Okay. Um, another thing is uh, we might have a vocative case, for example. So a vocative case is where you say, um, uh, it's a way of identifying the part of the sentence as something that you're addressing. Um, so, for example, O oh world, how art thou? Um, you would uh, put a little suffix or a prefix or something on world, especially in a, on a glutinating language like ours, um, that says world is the thing that you are addressing and hello is the thing that you're saying. You want to do that? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. So, vocative case marking. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So, what is the vocative case marker going to be? What? Ampersand? The, there isn't an ampersand in our phonetic inventory. Try again. You got the sounds. We went over them. Tilde is not a sound. <laughs> nice try. Come on. You had something. What? Key? Sure. K I or K? With a with a uvula. Key K. Key K. Key. Okay. So this might be something vaguely like Gabruch Kibu. Something like that, right? Um, okay. The problem is, uh, in order to actually make a sentence, we need syntax. So we've got some words. Uh, we need to know how to put them together to form a sentence. The usual basic way that you describe this is what's called basic word order, uh, which is in a simple sentence, uh, which has a complex linguistic definition, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, what order do you put the subject, the object, and the verb? Every possible order does exist in natural language, but some of them are really, really rare, uh, especially ones that put the object before the subject. Uh, so here are some examples. In Japanese, uh, the noun, the, the subject comes first. Uh, I'm totally blanking. That's a man. Otoko. Otoko wa inu o mita. Yeah, otoko. Thank you. Uh, otoko wa inu o mita. Uh, the man looked at the dog. Uh, or, when wa nana ke, ke kane i ka ilio. Um, these all put the verb and the subject in different relations to each other. So, which one do you want? SOV, SVO, or VSO? Ready? Cheers for SOV. No one. Cheers for SVO. Cheers for VSO. And number two. B again. Okay. Um, so now we're going to finish that sentence, and we're going to make a few more. So let's see. What did we choose? Uh, SVO. Right. Two. Uh, so SVO kind of implies uh, that it's probably going to be a head final uh, language, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so that means that adjectives come before nouns, uh, and that if you have what we call in English a preposition, it's going to come after the thing. So instead of I'm going to the conference, you would say I'm going conference to. Um, actually, in this language, it would be, uh, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm going conference to, because that's subject, verb, object. 
Okay, so in this case, it's, we don't really have a subject, verb, and object. You're not doing something to something. Um, so, okay, let's have a little bit more complicated a sentence. Um, one thing I like, the old hacker fixed Georg's code. Okay, so what words do we need in this? Recognize them. Come on, shout it out. Hacker. How do we say hacker in this language? Hut. Yeah? Okay. Uh, is hacker, in fact, one thing? Is it just the noun hacker? Or is it derived from something? Like, is there a verb hack, like in English, that we stick er on? make it an agent, or maybe vice versa. You could have hacker, and then you stick an appendix on to say the verb to hack. Which way do you want it? Based off of a verb? Okay, so uh, is hack hut, or is hack uh, something ha? Okay, sure. So ha is hack. Um, what other words do we need? Fix, okay? What's fix? Sorry? Moose, like that? Okay. Uh, so in this case, we actually have a past tense. Uh, else I'm gonna click this, agent. Or well, actually, it's not agent per se, but it's uh, verb. Okay, um, past tense. What's the suffix for past tense? Come on. You've got your little tinker toys, put them together. E. Okay. So moods E is fixed. Okay, what other words? Pick a word. Code. How do you say it? Maybe it's derived from hack again? Maybe not? What do you want? Ka? Sure. And then this would imply that maybe hack is derived from code or vice versa. Not really clear yet. Okay, what other words? Okay. Sorry? Right, so def, definite article. Do, I, do you guys all know what articles are? The and a. In English, they specify whether something is unique or not, more or less. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically. Um, so we'll get to that in a sec. What is old? What? Move. Okay. Uh, do you guys want to keep the definite article? There are some languages that don't have articles at all, like Russian, for example. Uh, this is one thing you'll notice for uh, Russian speakers speaking English. They'll mess up their articles all the time. They'll say A instead of the, or vice versa, or they'll just not put anything in at all because they don't really understand where you use them. Um, so it doesn't occur in Russian. Um, do we want to have it in this language? Yay, nay. Yay. Nay, nay, okay, so zero. Actually, I'm just gonna not have it because there's technically a difference between being zero and non-existent. Okay, uh, any other words? Georg, so Georg uh, is something that does need to fit. So for example, we don't have the sound eh. 
which is present in German. Uh, we don't have the untrilled R, which is what is used in this word. It's Georg, not Georg, G, right? Uh, so we do have G. We can have Gaorg, Georg, uh, Gorg, uh, Gaiorg. Uh, what? What do you guys want? What? What vowel? A, E, U, a combination. Shout it out. You're awake. A, Gaorg, Gog, Garg, rather Gog, or we don't have an O even, right? So just Gog. Sorry? Okay. So should the R be a trilled R, or should it be the back one that sounds kind of like an R to us, which is O, O, um, so R, or O, A or B, A, B, B, uh, okay. Uh, oops. Okay. And good. Okay, so Georg is now renamed to Garg. 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 Slightly different, right? Um, so you'll notice that this is something that all natural languages do. Uh, Japanese, for example, they don't have McDonald's. They have Makudanoraru. Why? Uh, it's because they can only have consonant vowel uh, and they force McDonald's, which doesn't fit that pattern, to fit that pattern by inserting vowels all over the place. Uh, so help me put this sentence together. So I'm just going to write each word underneath. We don't have the. We have old. Moob. Hacker. Is. Hot. Fixed. Muzi. Georg. Is now. Gorg. Code is ka. Okay. Uh, it is subject, verb, object. Um, however, the Georg's code, we've got a possessive there, right? Um, so how do we express possession? You can just add a uh, suffix like we do in English, the apostrophe s. Uh, you can ex just move them around. You can just put them next to each other. Uh, you can add uh, a paraphrase like the code possessed by Georg. Lots of ways to express it. How do you want to do it? Expressed by? OK. Um, so in that case, we need possess, the verb. OK. What's the verb possess? or own. Oops. Oh, what the hell? What? OK, open office crashed. Uh, what the hell? OK, not. Too bad, I guess. I'll just ignore that. Possess. What's possess? R. R. Okay. Uh, so, for example, how would you say Georg possesses code? That would be Gar. R. G. Right? And for simplicity, let's say we just butt them together like that. Uh, so then the old hacker, whoa, the old hacker fixed Gerald's code is mukhat muzi ghat akha. Yes? Ah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Open Office. Right. OK. Uh, so obviously, if you're making a real language, you go in a lot more depth than this. All I'm trying to give here is sort of an 
a broad sense of what is involved. Uh, in a real example, what you want to do is uh, change it a lot over time. It's an iterative process. Um, even a really, really good language does not happen in one sitting. It happens after changing things over and over again, starting over sometimes, ripping out things you don't like, and so forth. Uh, people also spend a lot of time developing cultures and worlds uh, that go along with the languages. Like, for example, Tolkien is well known to have said that he made the world of Middle Earth for his languages and not the other way around. Um, whereas, for example, Klingon was definitely made uh, to fit in a pre-existing cultural melange and all that. Uh, people also sometimes make whole families of languages and so forth, formal languages, informal languages, etc. Um, for now, it's kind of pointless to just do something and not tell anyone about it. There's a big online community of conlanging. Uh, we all talk to each other, we share our work, uh, we translate some stuff together, like uh, the Babel text. Uh, we translate poems from each other's languages. We send in each other Christmas cards in our languages. Um, to participate, basically, all you have to do is have your document online somewhere and join the mailing lists. Um, it's not that hard, so please do. There's a lot of places you can find out more. Conlang and the ZBB are the two really big fora. Uh, they're fairly different in personality. One is a mailing list, one is a bulletin board. Uh, ZBB is a bit more informal and younger. Uh, Conlang is a bit more formal, a bit more polite, um, and uh, tends to have people who uh, know a little bit more academically about linguistics, but there are a lot of people who are on both. Um, describing morphosyntax is probably the single best book to get if you want to learn. Uh, it's really meant for field linguists who are documenting an endangered language. Uh, it's the process by which they interview people in the Amazon or wherever uh, to find out what language they speak and document it. Uh, but it turns out that asking someone how to speak their language and making your own language is a very similar thing. Uh, Okren's book is also really good. It's a, a history of Hanlang uh, from uh, the lingua ignota of Hildegard von Bingen uh, all the way to the present. Um, and there's more in my paper. If you want to learn more, you can also visit our website at conlang.org. Uh, we do a lot of things for conlangers. We've got a podcast. We've added to our RSS. Uh, we have a conference. Uh, the next one is scheduled to be in Europe sometime, hopefully later this year, uh, maybe next year early. Um, we even have jobs for professional conlangers, like I mentioned. Uh, we recently finished one for HBO. Uh, to make their Dothraki language. Uh, if you want to uh, make something for a project you're working on and you don't want to spend all the effort learning linguistics and learning how to do this professionally, or you know someone who's working on a game or a movie or a TV show or whatever, and instead of using some made up garbage that's you know just uh, random gibberish, they could have a real language behind it. Uh, they could. Uh, involve their fans in speaking this language. Look what happened to Klingon, uh, or Quenya for that matter. There are people who do this hardcore, and it can really build up a base around the thing. So shameless plug, hire us. Um, and if you find what we do useful, uh, or if you find it interesting, uh, become a member. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, all the money that we get just goes directly to stuff that we do for the community. Uh, members get nice perks, for example, a pin, uh, hosting services, some other stuff. Uh, I actually have pins with me, so if you want to join within the next few days, you can get it on the spot. Um, we also need people to do audio and video editing, so if you do that, let me know. Um, in one hour from now, upstairs in Hannah, I'm going to be showing three short films that I think you'll find enjoyable. Um, one of them is a romantic comedy, and uh, one of them is a documentary that I mentioned. Um, here is a clip of the first one. Hi, Akar. Have you taboo too, Scanny Bay? 
ushivu. Kitsen fil kwem tazna. Valune uskanif? Malak. Maman vel ulis uh, eleker liarak et mir felkar. Ivana puts vel ukeke. Yeah, I literally have no idea. I mean, this thing's just way too complicated. You want to know how that ends one hour from now? It's really funny. I, I, I recommend it. Um, I'm doing one other thing here at Nauticon, which is a uh, workshop on meditation for hackers. It's probably not what you're thinking of, you know, sitting alone in a room in lotus position with incense and Sarah McLaughlin, uh, chanting om, 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 om. No. I'm not like that. Uh, and I'm not going to be doing any of the woo or the dogma or the religious bullshit. Um, speaking of religious bullshit, uh, you guys probably all know what Xenu is. Yeah? Show of hands, who knows Xenu? Yeah. How about E meter? Anyone know what the E meter is? Yeah? Uh, do you know what TR8 is? Tone 40? Uh, Dear Alice? No? Okay. So this is the problem. Uh, you guys know what. Very, 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 very late Scientologists know. The vast majority of people do not get taught anything about Xenu. What they do get taught is the communications course, which teaches you how to, how to be a ro I mean, it teaches you how to communicate freely with everyone. Um, if you want to actually not be affected by brainwashing techniques, you need to know what they're doing to you, what their effect is, and why it works. Uh, you guys don't, and you are just as vulnerable to being fucked with uh, as anyone else who doesn't know about Scientology, so long as it's presented as something slightly different. So come and get your inoculation. I do a lot of other stuff. CSSfingerprint.com is uh, hacking. That went up recently. Open it up, you'll see, you'll like. Um, it, it does something interesting. And it, no, it doesn't do anything mean until you press the button. And then it only does what it says it does. Um, that's how to contact me. Uh, if you want to know more, you can also just get my card. If you want postcards, stickers, come up here. And I really like feedback, so Twitter, uh, email me. This is the form to give me feedback. Let me know. Thank you. So, any questions? <laughs>